Last year, on the 1st of December, we sat down with our five-year-old daughter, Katie, to help her compose her letter to Santa. This annual tradition was beloved in my own childhood, and we had begun doing it with Katie two years ago when she was four. That year, she gleefully dictated a list of toys, clothes, and fictional creatures that she wanted. Last year, having started kindergarten, Katie insisted on composing the letter herself. After writing the list of things she desired, she scrawled to Santa on the front of the envelope. Or at least, she tried to. What she actually wrote was, to Satan. I thought it was hilarious while my wife was torn between amusement and horror. We put the letter in the mailbox and sent it as it was. Just days later, we received a letter back. It was addressed to Katie and had a postmark from the North Pole. At first I thought it was going to be some cutesy form letter sent out by the post office to all the Santa letter senders. I sat Katie down on my lap and we opened it together. I began to read. Dear Katie, I have received your letter. I wish to assure you my elves are hard at work at making all the things on your list. They're working especially hard on the unicorn bedspread you've asked for. Her name? Specific items from her list? If this was a form letter, someone at the post office went to a great deal of effort to include specific details regarding each recipient. It struck me as unlikely. It was handwritten too, or it appeared to be. Perhaps it was a relative or a friend that my wife brought in as a little holiday merriment. I didn't recognize the handwriting, but I continued reading. However, I am sad to say that you are presently on my naughty list. Not to worry, you still have time to get onto the nice list, since all your gifts are still being made. But if you fail to move over to the nice list, your gifts will be given to other children instead. I stopped reading here as Katie had grown quite anxious. Why am I on the naughty list? I've been good, haven't I? She asked me, a tear starting to form in her green eyes. I kissed her on the cheek. Of course you have, sweetie. You've been very good. I'm sure Santa just made a mistake. This wasn't right. Nobody I knew would be this cruel to a child. Katie had almost no behavioral issues. She really was an angel. Honey, do you know of anyone who'd send us a prank letter from Santa? They know what's on her Christmas list, I say so my wife could hear from the other room. No, I can't think of anyone who would do that. How would they know what's on her list? She asked, stepping into the room and picking up Katie who was still upset. With Katie safely removed from further trauma, I set to finishing the letter with concern intending to get to the bottom of this mean joke. Remember, Katie, I see you when you're sleeping. I know when you're awake. I know all about what you did to your baby brother. Nearly drowning him in the bathtub like that was very naughty. You're lucky your mom saved him, or else you would have been on the naughty list for life. I once again stopped reading. My heart was pounding. My hands began to shake. My eyes darted around the room nervously. William, her four-month-old baby brother, had nearly drowned about a month prior to this. Somehow he managed to slip out of his bathtub harness during a 30-second period of unsupervision. My wife felt awful. She beat herself up about it for weeks. The bathtub harness was meant to keep the baby upright so that the parent could turn their backs for short moments without fear of drowning. We had assumed it was a freak accident that he managed to get out of the harness, or perhaps one of the straps wasn't snapped properly. Whoever had sent this letter seemed to think it was Katie that had done it. Unthinkable. She loves her baby brother. She wouldn't be capable of such premeditated malice. But how would they know? We hadn't told another living soul. We chose to keep the incident quiet because no harm had been done, and it was a painful memory for my wife. Angry, as well as frightened, I continued on reading. There's only one way to correct such a serious act of naughtiness. Next time you're in the bath, 
you must try to drown yourself. If your mom or dad save you, you will have learned your lesson. If you die, you'll be moved on to my nice list and go to heaven where your gifts will be waiting for you. Hoping you make the right choice. Signed, Santa. Upon finishing the twisted letter, my blood began to boil. Who in their right mind would send this to a child? The letter was clenched tightly in my fist, partially crumpled. My wife rushed to my aid. What happened? Are you all right? Take this thing. Burn it. But don't read it. Don't ever read it, I said, holding out the letter in a shaking hand. She took the letter with apprehension and helped me to my feet. What happened? Are we in danger? She asked. I don't know, but next time Katie takes a bath, do not let her out of your sight. She blinked, looking down at the letter, but I snatched it back. You really don't want to read it, I repeated. In an act of impulse, I crumpled it into a ball, stuffed it down the drain, and turned on the garbage disposal. Honey, what was in that letter? She demanded. Somehow they knew about what happened with William in the bath. I answered plainly, unable to give voice to those dreadful words that followed. She impatiently turns the disposal off. I'm going to take the kids to my mom's house. Whoever sent that knows where we live. I nodded. Go. My guess is they stole her letter out of the mailbox and then wrote that awful reply. How they know about the bath incident is beyond me. Go ask Katie if she's told anyone and try to think of anyone you may have told, even anonymously. Above all else, do not let Katie be alone in the bathtub for any amount of time. If they know this much, we can't be certain they haven't already contacted Katie in some other way, I said. What's so important about watching her in the bath? She's been bathing mostly on her own for a few months, my wife protested. If you get any more letters, don't read them. Call me, I said. Twenty minutes later, all the kids were seated in the car, a change of clothes packed, stroller and diaper bag loaded and about to leave. Daddy, am I in trouble? Katie asked from her booster seat. William was next to her in his car seat, and I leaned through the open passenger door. No, sweetie, not at all. I kissed her on the cheek and closed the door as I watched my wife drive them away. I paced around the house, thinking, agitated. I contemplated calling the police but the evidence was in pieces, melted by grimy sink water. Besides, no threats had actually been made, only accusations and suggestions. I wandered aimlessly into Katie and William's bedroom. Several letter blocks, the kind kids used to build words, were sitting on top of their dresser, out of Katie's reach. Let her die, they spelled out. In a state of panic now, I lurched towards my gun safe. Every shadow was a terror, every sound a nightmare. They were inside our house, or had to have been very recently. There was no chance my wife would have missed the letters while she was packing away their clothes for the trip. I fumbled with the safe controls, until at last, I had my gun in hand, a six-shot revolver. Who are you? I shouted into the empty house. What do you want? I checked every room and every closet, gun at the ready at all times, but I couldn't find a soul. I calmed myself down a bit more now that I knew the house was clear. The doorbell camera and alarm records came up negative. No signs of forced entry. I checked again and again. Whoever it was had been in and out quickly and quietly and left no trace. It didn't make any sense. I spent day and night watching our mailbox from the upstairs window, watching to see if anyone visited it, but it remained untouched. I periodically walked the house, gun still in hand, checking every door and window, and confirming over and over that no one was in the house. 
Around 9 p.m., my wife called me. The kids are asleep, but my folks are worried. They don't really understand what's happening, because neither do I. I took the kids here because you were terrified. But now, I need the whole and complete truth, she said. She was right. In a monotone voice, I told her exactly what was in the letter. I never told anyone, she said. Not even anonymously. I swear. I asked Katie, but she wouldn't give me any straight answers. She eventually confessed she told a friend, but wouldn't say which friend. You don't think she actually... No, I said emphatically. She wouldn't. Somehow they found out about the bath incident, and they're just inventing the fiction that Katie did it to hurt us. For what reason, I don't know. Try to sleep. I know it's going to be hard, but staying awake all night won't help. I hear your tiredness. Lock the doors, set the alarm, then sleep, she said. I love you. Take care of the kids, and I'll call you first thing in the morning, I replied. I hung up. I didn't tell her about the blocks. That would only terrify her. Maybe I should have. Put her on guard. Whoever did this knew us. They could easily have known where my in-laws lived. And whoever it was, was a skilled burglar. I called my father-in-law, Donald. In him, I confided that there had been evidence of danger. He agreed not to tell my wife about the blocks, as she needed to be a mom that kept the kids calm. She'd be likely to panic if she knew the full truth. He agreed to stay up through the night, for which I was very grateful and thanked him profusely. I didn't sleep. How could I? I pledged that if anything else like this occurred, I would call the police, even if they might think I was crazy. The next morning, I got a call at sunrise from my wife. I looked at my buzzing phone, terrified. Something happened. I just knew it. Why else would she be calling this early? With shaking hands, I answered it. Hey, honey, are the kids all right? They're fine, but something has happened. My heart rate quickened. My mouth went dry. I didn't speak, letting my paws demonstrate my terror. There is a present here. A gift under the Christmas tree. It wasn't there yesterday, and neither of my folks put it there. We think it was whoever sent the letter. It's addressed to Katie. From Santa. Do not open it. I'm on my way. I must have broken a half a dozen traffic laws on the way. When I arrived, I found the family in a predictably agitated state. I kept watch, but somehow the son of a bitch slipped by me, Donald said privately, after I had hugged and kissed my wife and kids. He got by me too. Don't blame yourself, I said, patting him on the shoulder. The gift was in a gold-colored wrapping paper and topped with a blood-red bow. It was slightly larger than a shoebox and not especially heavy. I inspected the tag. I spotted what the others hadn't seen at first, that the card folded open like a book, held shut by a sticker around the edge. On the front, it said, To Katie, from Santa. On the inside, the tag had a short handwritten message. How did we miss that? My mother-in-law Susie said, peering over my shoulder. Please go and entertain the kids for a moment. I don't want Katie to overhear. I suspect what we're about to read will frighten us all, I replied to her. She nodded and hurried upstairs. Dear Katie, since our meeting last night went so well, I have given you this gift as a reward for agreeing to my instructions. Here I paused. Meeting. He was in our house and spoke to Katie while I was downstairs watching the front door, Donald said. I'm going to be sick, my wife said. Following instructions. What does that mean? I'll tell you later. There's more to the note. Clearing my throat, I carried on. Don't open it until Christmas. 
Remember, if you die, it will be waiting for you in heaven, just like I promised. There came a scream from upstairs, Susie's shrill and panicked yell. In a state of supreme terror, I led the way, trotting up the stairs. Susie was screaming the entire time. It triggered William to start crying from his crib, creating a slurry of chaotic sounds when combined with our booming footsteps. She was in the upstairs bedroom, clutching Katie, who was drenched in water and limp in her arms. My wife screamed, and Donald collapsed to his knees. I crashed into the bathroom and took my daughter into my arms. Her eyes were shut, and her lips and face were blue. She was face down in the tub. She couldn't have been alone for more than five minutes. I didn't know she would... Susie wailed, unable to continue. My wife collapsed into a hysterical fit beside her father. I frantically banged on Katie's back, hoping to expel the water from her lungs. She has a pulse, Susie says, while I kept hitting her in the back. She had her hand on my daughter's small, limp wrist. Come on, Katie. Breathe, I begged. Tears were falling down my face. Then at last, just when I thought all hope had been lost, she coughed and spat out mouthfuls of water, then began to breathe and gasp for air. Oh, thank God, I whispered while clutching her little body tightly, hugging her as I never have before. Am I on the nice list again? She muttered weakly. I wrapped a towel around her to give her some dignity in a bathroom full of people. Donald was where he collapsed, in the hall outside the bathroom, laying in the same spot he was when he first saw his granddaughter's near lifeless body being held in his wife's arms. He's not breathing, my wife said, holding her father's hand. Susie wailed once more and dove to her husband's side. They began trying to wake him up, frantically looking for signs of life at the same time. But Donald's body laid quiet and still. Mom, he's gone, my wife said. I watched as they descended into tears of grief and panic. Katie was awake, but completely mute. I carried her to the guest bedroom so she wouldn't have to witness any of this. She had nearly died, and now her grandpa had passed, all within moments. I left the two women to their grief and took her into the bedroom where her brother was still crying. I got her dressed and put her to sleep. She appeared to be alright, or at the very least, was no longer in immediate peril. Her pulse was strong, and her breathing went back to normal. I calmed down my son and sat at the end of Katie's bed. Hours later, the dust of the morning had settled. The cause of death had been determined for my father-in-law, a massive heart attack. The panic had no doubt triggered it. He had a history of heart problems and his granddaughter nearly drowning had done him in. Katie wouldn't speak to any of us except in one word, evasive replies. I gently tried to question her on the event, why she had done it and if she had spoken with anyone during the night, but I made no progress. I decided to leave her be. The poor girl was traumatized. As the authorities wheeled Donald's body out onto a stretcher, I stood with my wife in the living room. Susie was with the kids, as she had been unable to bring herself to watch them moving her husband. She was determined to correct what she perceived as her mistake in almost allowing Katie to drown. We had assured her that she was not to blame, but there was no convincing her. I noticed ash on the carpet around the hearth and near the adjacent tree. This drew my attention to the fireplace, where I also noticed the grate in the firebox was askew. It came down the chimney. Whatever it was, or whoever it was, I said quietly. My wife clutched my arm. Should we open it? she asked with her eyes on the present. Yes, I think we need to play their game for now, before more people get hurt. We took it to the kitchen table 
and I unwrapped it with a massive sense of apprehension. It was the unicorn bedspread, exactly like the one she'd asked for. A comforter with a unicorn made of small plastic gems was attached to the front, depicted amidst a field of stars and planets. It's beautiful, my wife said as I unfolded it and spread it out for us to see. We aren't giving it to Katie. Hopefully she'll forget all about it, I said. Look, my wife exclaimed, pointing to the bottom. I turned the blanket around, reading the words stitched into the comforter. One death, one life. Welcome back to the nice list, Katie. Until next year. Christmas is soon, and every time I check the mailbox, my heart beats a little bit faster.